There we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. So we're really, really lucky that we've got Dr. Giuseppe, and I'm not going to attempt uh, the pronunciation as Patrick just done a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, so we've got a wonderful talk today about uh, marine mammal protected areas. And it's quite relevant at the moment. We've got consultations in the UK about highly marine protected areas, uh, and it's a topic in a lot of places as well. So hopefully we'll have a good conversation and some great questions today. So firstly, um, who is the MMOA? So my name is Ashley. I'm the chair of the Marine Mammal Observer Association. So we are an association that aims to work with, with professionals experienced in um, environmental mitigation offshore that could be newly qualified professionals it could be people that have been out there for 10 20 years and um, we try to be a collective voice for those freelancers and professionals that work offshore um, and maybe are working on their own in lots of different environments so we try and sort of pull everybody together um, and offer that support and yeah. also membership benefits as well. If you are a member with us, we do offer benefits. We have really excitingly uh, opened the uh, travel camp recently for the European Cetacean Society Conference. Um, and we have had a winner of that. So we're just waiting to announce that. So we've got quite a few uh, things going on and the members do get quite a lot of benefits as well. So if you are interested, do just send us an email or have a look at our website and we can certainly lead you into the right direction. So leading on to today's webinar. So really, really grateful. Uh, we have- Yes, <laughs> delivering the webinar to us today. If everyone could just make sure that they're on mute, that would be fantastic. We won't get any feedback then. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so we're gonna be, um, we've got a webinar today about Emma's from Concept in the Mediterranean going on to a global initiative. So if you do have any questions about the MMOA or anything like that, do just send us an email, but I will hand over to Patrick now um, to introduce our speaker for today. Yeah, I'm just uh, going to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Giuseppe Notar Bartolo di Chiara. Uh, what happened to my, oh, there we go, I'm back. Sorry, <laughs> some screen uh, slides just, windows just popped up on my screen there. Um, I, I don't think, um, I mean, Dr. Nardar Notar Bartolo de Chiara. Hopefully, I got it right this time. Um, really needs much of an introduction. Giuseppe, you've been uh, you've been working in in the area of marine protected areas for uh, decades now, um, and you, you started in the Mediterranean, I guess, but uh, you were working across in the U.S. and you've worked in most parts of the world, probably. And now uh, you're working with the IUCN with IMAS uh, and. And thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, and I, I know you're not in your, your best form at the moment. So uh, thank you for, for making this effort to, to deliver this webinar. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you, Patrick. And thank you, MMOI, for inviting me to this. First, uh, before I even begin, I just wanted to uh, let you know that I have not been run over by a truck. Uh, I, I very more, much more, uh, 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 simply have been hit by some sort of uh, sciatica and uh, I hope in a few days I will be in a better situation but uh, really the only uh, condition I can uh, be uh, slightly comfortable is horizontal as unfortunately some of you probably already know uh, but I, I hope you don't. Um, so anyway, um, I think uh, from now on I will spare you my uh, uh, the uh, the pitiful sight of myself, and uh, continue uh, with uh, photograph. And uh, but the most important thing is that I'm going to start with the um, with the presentation and hope that you will be able to see it. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. This is not the first slide. Okay. 
So uh, what I um, uh, what I would like to do in the uh, in the limited time that we have available uh, is to give you really uh, a quick overview of uh, the uh, important marine mammal area initiative. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the history and the uh, process and the results so far, and most importantly, what we uh, we think and hope that IMAs are uh, can be. Uh, used for uh, the conservation of um, uh, all marine mammals. Um, if I am fast enough, I hope that we will have time uh, to uh, for questions and answers because uh, usually that is the most interesting part of any presentation, at least in my experience. So uh, without further ado, uh, a little bit of a history of the uh, of the EMAs. We started um, a few years ago uh, with my colleague, Eric Hoyt, uh, who is the co-chair of the uh, IUCN Task Force for Marine Mammal Protected Areas, uh, to consider that um, um, marine mammals were not adequately uh, represented within uh, the uh, marine protected areas of the world. Uh, there were uh, more than uh, 600 uh, MPAs at the time, we're talking about 15 years ago, more or less, uh, which include some marine mammal habitat, uh, very few marine protected areas that are being established on the purpose of uh, protecting marine mammals, uh, no special protection for most species and populations, more real, real protection, I mean. Um, uh, there was a, quite a bit of uh, political bias uh, in the sense that uh, some of these marine mammal MPAs were not really MPAs because they had been established like uh, uh, on, as a blanket over the e, the whole EZ of particular countries. So nothing really, uh, really uh, targeting uh, marine mammal protecting uh, protected spaces. And uh, so the situation was uh, really not good enough for applying space-based space, uh, space uh, protection to marine mammals. So in 2013, we uh, established a task force within the AOCN, both uh, World Commission Protected Areas and uh, Species Survival Commission uh, to um, uh, tackle this problem. Uh, at least to contribute uh, to, to address this problem. And uh, the first uh, and for now most important activities that the task force has embarked on was the, the, uh, the establishment of the program of uh, important marine mammal areas or EMAs. Uh, so I think the, the key uh, message here of the whole thing is what really are EMAs? Uh, we have a definition, you can see it here. Uh, there are discrete portions of habitat, which is important for one or more marine mammal species that have the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. So this is the, the, the potential is the keyword because they are not marine protected areas. Uh, they are uh, not identified on the basis of management consideration. Uh, what they really are is that uh, they are uh, evidence-driven, they're based on science, uh, they are purely biocentric process based on the application of scientific criteria and on the best available science, which unfortunately in many cases is not very much available. And that is one of our problems, uh, but... Um, uh, hopefully with time, that problem is going to be mitigated. So the important thing is that EMAs are science. They are not management. They are not policy. Um, and, and this <clears throat> really has saved us from the wrath of a lot of uh, uh, institutional administrations and, uh, and politicians. Because um, you know we go uh, across the, the the world regions as uh, I'll show you in a while, 
um, to uh, identify EMS uh, on, on the base of science. And there is no way that anybody can come to us and tell us, you know, I don't really want anima in my waters uh, because it's not a political thing. It's only a scientific thing. So if some, we, we have actually, uh, it has happened that some uh, um, institutional persons had come to us and say, but really, what are you doing? You, you cannot do this in, 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 in the waters of my country. And our answer was, look, um, if you have uh, scientific reasons for criticizing that particular EMA, uh, then we'll be very happy to discuss it with you. But um, this is what they are. You know, they are based on the science that has been accrued across time. And uh, uh, if you don't like anima to be there, there is really not much we can do about it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, in the end, uh, we, we, we never really had serious problems about that. Uh, now, okay, uh, I was telling you about the criteria. I'll go very quickly about, uh, across them. They were developed uh, throughout, uh, you know, a few years of consultations, public consultation, and um, and and consultation with colleagues. So there is one. The first criterion is uh, about species or population vulnerability. We normally base ourselves on the IUCN red list. Uh, there is a, a and and for the criterion A, we only consider species or populations that are in the first three uh, levels of threat, meaning critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. Uh, the second criterion is about distribution and abundance. We had, you know, whether it's a small and resident population or whether this is an area where aggregations occur. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, the third group of criteria uh, has to do with key uh, life cycle areas. So if it's a breeding area, feeding area, or a migratory area. And finally, uh, the uh, last uh, group of criteria is about special attributes, uh, either distinctiveness for some special uh, characteristic of the population in that area, or because that area has a very high level of marine mammal diversity species. So this is all you need to know now for uh, as far as uh, criteria concerned. So, uh, the um, process we have been identifying the EMS uh, is uh, uh, on a region by region basis. And uh, you can see here uh, in yellow, the regions that we have covered already. Uh, and in blue, the ones that are, I'm sorry, the pink one is almost done. Uh, we did the workshop in December. And uh, we are almost, uh, we now have the response from the reviewers and uh, we'll just have to interact with the uh, point of contacts of the different events to uh, accept uh, the reviewers uh, conditions and, and, and place them on the Atlas. So that's done and uh, almost. And then uh, this coming May in a couple of months from now, we're gonna do the Northeast Atlantic Ocean and uh, next year uh, we're going to do the Northwest Atlantic and the um, and the wider Caribbean. So this was our uh, opening uh, dance, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, which was funded by the uh, by the Mava Foundation, and uh, we've done this in uh, um, cooperation with ACOBAMS and with the um, uh, offices of the Barcelona Convention, which is the regional seas uh, organization. Here you see also the Black Sea, but the Black Sea was the subject of a further workshop. And um, we can go in further detail about the, uh, the events in the Mediterranean later, if there is time, if, and, if you, and if you have uh, questions about that. So, uh, the Mediterranean was the first, and then the second was the uh, Pacific Islands region. <clears throat> then we went on to the Northeast uh, Indian Ocean and the South uh, uh, Asian Seas. Then we did the Northwest uh, 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 Indian Ocean. 
uh, then uh, the uh, extended Southern Ocean, uh, the uh, Australia and New Zealand and the Southeast Indian. And finally, uh, the seventh was uh, during the um, uh, lockdown. Uh, we had some money uh, that we could have saved and we could do the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea entirely um, uh, online, entirely remotely. And then uh, last year, we, uh, with the COVID abated, we met in Costa Rica for the um, uh, Southeast Pacific. And then in December, we did the, uh, the Southwest Atlantic. So uh, also I wanted to say that uh, most of these EMAs, except the first, was uh, were funded by uh, the German government. Uh, the first was funded by MAVA. The, the uh, fifth there in the extended Southern Ocean was funded by the French government. Um, so speaking still about the process a little bit, uh, there is a predefined process, uh, which is uh, developed uh, in consultation with the local, the regional marine mammal science and conservation community. And uh, uh, we solicit the submission of preliminary areas of interest, really what they are, they're polygons with uh, some data in it. Uh, then at the workshop, uh, we work on the, this POI to identify uh, candidate EMAs uh, that then are uh, accepted by the workshop. So there is some sort of a collective authoritiveness uh, about what the candidate EMAs are put forth. And then after the workshop, the candidate EMAs are submitted to an independent review panel like experts. Uh, that um, uh, and there is a, a review process that lasts several months uh, before the EMAs are then um, uh, accepted and placed on the uh, uh, EMA e atlas, which is available on the uh, on the internet. Uh, this is the way it looks at the moment, and uh, you see the yellow things there are the EMAs. The uh, the pink are the the the, the emas that didn't really quite make it to the ema stage because the uh, there was some 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 work that needed to be done still uh, but that could be done can be done between the ema secretariat and the point of contacts uh, so they're almost there and those are pink and then the blue that you can see here, for example, I, you, know, you can see my cursor. This, for example, is a big blue area that those are still areas of interest. They remain like that until the next workshop of that particular region, because it was deemed that they were interesting, that were probably worth you know, paying attention to, but uh, we didn't you know, have enough data and we didn't have uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the, the the information that we needed to make sure that those were solid emas. Uh, this is just a um, a brief summary on uh, uh, on on where we are now. So we uh, examined eight regions, which is not really true because we examined nine, but the ninth, uh, the Southwest Atlantic, is not ready to be um, to be accounted for yet because of the uh, the process is almost finished. We um, uh, identified 209 EMAs. Uh, these do not include the CMAs and the AOIs. Uh, this, the percent of the global waters that uh, we had examined is at the moment 67%. Uh, the areas covered by EMA uh, are in the total 11% of the um, of the water that we have examined. Uh, the number of marine mammal species for which EMAs were identified is 78, which is 60% of the total. And uh, that's it. This is just to give you an idea. I don't expect you to read the name of the species, but um, it, there is a high level of uh, variability uh, in uh, how many times a particular species 
is represented in anima. The big winner, and now take into consideration that this is most, mostly the uh, southern hemisphere, so things might change quite a bit when we expand into the north of the planet. Uh, the, uh, the big winner is the uh, humpback whale there at the top, uh, followed by uh, sperm whale, and the uh, striped dolphin is at the very bottom, probably because the striped dolphins is very difficult to identify anima specifically for the striped dolphins because they are everywhere and, uh, and, and very, very widely distributed. Uh, the in interesting thing is that in this, in the few years in which we have had emas on the map, remember that the first year in which we placed emas on the map was 2017, so it's five years ago, not even, and uh, uh, so we had quite a bit of interest from various sectors of society, um, uh, because of course you can, anybody can ask uh, for the shape files of the EMAs with the associated metadata. And uh, so you can see here that we had, this was about a couple of uh, months ago, 438 requests. Uh, industry and business was 22%. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, outside of academia, which is at the bottom of the table is the uh, the ones that we're most interested in knowing where the emas are in this yeah sorry i hear somebody coming in um but uh this is interesting for for you perhaps because you're uh, my mom observers and, and you work with the industry more than anybody else in the in the community and um uh, and you can see in the uh, in the uh, pie charts uh, below uh, that uh, on the left uh, is the geographic scope of the request must come from Europe for some reason, and um, uh, on the uh, on the right uh, you have you know the commercial is the blue, uh, then you have research uh, the. Uh, Orange and uh, conservation and education are the other two. Um, a little bit uh, on the um, on the website, uh, the uh, task force, the EMAs have um, um, uh, a dedicated website. You can go there and you can inspect the um, e atlas. And uh, if you click on uh, one of the yellow uh areas then you have a summary that opens uh, this one is the northwest mediterranean sea slope and canyon system ima you get the summary and then uh, uh, you go you scroll down and you get to the uh, point in which you can download uh, the fact sheet about that particular ima uh, as a pdf and uh, the fact sheet contains all the information and also a little bit more than what you have in the summary with a description, uh, some extra maps, uh, et cetera, and the, uh, and the, um, sorry. And also the, um, the uh, scientific documentation, scientific papers on which that email was based. So uh, there is a huge amount of information that you can get from, uh, from the e-atlas, but then if you wish, you can also, um, obtain all the shape files. When we send shape files, we don't send shape files of a particular EMA, we send the whole package. And then finally, this is you know where I wanted to finish is because so at the end of all this work, what are really EMAs good for? So that's a big question. Because of course we have uh, gone through a huge investment to uh, to generate this tool, and the uh, but any tool it's only as useful as uh, as much as it is used. Uh, so the important thing is that uh, the society really takes the emas and goes go away with with them uh, doing something good for the marine mammals. So uh, there has been 
you know, some initiatives uh, already. The um, uh, well, the uh, Convention on Migratory Species has adopted a resolution supporting the EMAS and asking the parties to support the EMAS. Uh, the, uh, we have already uh, had a lot of interactions with the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity to, uh, to improve with uh, information on marine mammals, uh, their process of the ecologically or biologically significant areas. Uh, some countries have already started using uh, the EMA information uh, to in their marine spatial mapping process. Um, uh, some uh, countries have uh, started thinking about establishing marine protected areas based on, uh, on EMAS. Uh, there is a very interesting process going on at this moment in the Mediterranean because four countries, including Spain, um, France, Monaco, and Italy have proposed to the IMO uh, the establishment of a PSSA in the Northwest Mediterranean over ANIMA. And uh, uh, then of course, there is the uh, IUCN sponsored uh, program of K biodiversity areas uh, that um, uh, we work with because quite a few EMAs can then be converted into KBAs. Uh, here on the left, you have, you know, a number of uh, uh, organizations that have been working with us. And, uh, and I think I'll stop here. Yeah, this is the end of my presentation, but I'll be very happy to, to participate in the discussion and, and, and answer any questions you might have. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, really, really interesting uh, presentation. And I'm sure for people that we've got on this call, they're thinking about mm. mitigation and, and how this would impact mitigation decisions. Um, certainly, marine mammal consultants uh, may be thinking about how this could input into um, cons environmental impact assessments um, and things like that. Uh, really, really interesting talk. I've got two questions, if it's not cheeky enough of me to kick off. <laughs> um, so I'll start with uh, my first question, and you may have mentioned this uh, during the talk, so apologies if I've missed this, but I saw from the map that you've um, completed quite a few regions. I just wondered how often, I know there's still some to, to complete, so that's probably the priority at the moment, but how often are you going to be reassessing or revising those mm. images? We haven't done that yet because um, we have um, uh, foreseen, uh, maybe with a little bit of optimism, that we will be able to complete the planet in 10 years. And we started in 2016, so we have uh, a few more years, three or four years to go before we complete that. And uh, we have funding uh, for the next uh, two uh, so we're still, you know, fundraising for uh, the uh, for the remaining ones. Also, we're doing freshwater inland uh, marine mammals, of course, too. And uh, so we hope that in 2026 we will be able to redo the Mediterranean, and that will be uh, extremely interesting because it will uh, allow us to see you know what has happened in these 10 years in terms of uh, emas in terms of marine mammal populations in terms of the uh, conservation and management uh, uh, panorama that we have in the area and um, and uh, and also see you know whether the emas really need to a major overhaul or or, or or just the small updates here and there. And this is also uh, important because we are very conscious of the fact that uh, we are identifying EMAs in uh, a situation where uh, the goalpost keeps being changed by climate change. And, uh, and uh, but if we manage to uh, uh correctly uh to 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 achieve to 
uh, redo, review uh, any region on uh, more or less a decadal basis, I think we will be able to cover that. That's interesting. So it could be every 10 years that they get renewed, but certainly um, looking at revising the MED in 2026. And yeah, I, I agree. It would be really interesting to see that what the types of changes that have happened. Um, considering now you have that baseline. Um, yeah, really interesting. And then my second question um, is in terms of how these IMAs are determined or, or what type of information, I know they're not protected sites, what type of information is used um, to inform the IMA? So I know for some for protected sites, you can use real data, so sightings data, and um, some are based on model data. Um, I just wondered if there are any data and um, specifications or or data um, sort of quality control measures that you have where you don't don't allow certain data or do allow certain data to inform the inner. That's correct. Uh, we don't uh, um, take model data into consideration for the establishment or uh, the identification of anima because we. Uh, uh, wish uh, we are really keen on having the IMA very solidly uh, grounded in observations. So what we do is that we, when we uh, address a region, we start about five months before the workshop and uh, we um, um, uh, contact all the experts, uh, specific experts of uh, you know, uh, place-based conservation of marine mammals of that particular region. And um, uh, usually we manage to put around the table uh, anything between 30 and 40 experts in a meeting. And, uh, and, uh, and we use everything that we can in terms of, you know, starting from published data uh then uh, uh, going on to gray literature that is based on original uh, observations that is produced by people that we can trust uh and then also to uh, you know to the uh, personal ex experience of the uh, people that come at the meetings which usually are people that you know be working in the field and uh, and collecting those data but at the end, the reason why we have a, a review panel, which usually passes about um, anything between 65 to 70 percent of the uh, candidate emails that are proposed, is that um, uh, the every uh, email template has to be very convincing uh, in terms of the information that it uses. And uh, if it's not convincing, they become, they remain AOI, areas of interest, and they will be addressed again 10 years later. Okay. So the, the EMAs really, they go through two levels of scrutiny, uh, which is a collective scrutiny. The first is at the end of the workshop where most of the, uh, of the experts of the region have gathered. And the second is the uh, the review panel. That's really interesting. Thank you. And I think that grey literature is actually turning out to be really important in terms of, I, I think you're referring to like Facebook sighting groups, um, WhatsApp groups regionally, local um, groups, things like that. They are turning out to be really important for, you know, tracking animals and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting. I'm um, mm -hmm. definitely going to have a deep dive into the website after this talk. Um, oh, one, one thing I didn't say, sorry, is that the species actually that we consider, they, they, they come into two categories. One is the qualifying species, and those are the ones on which we base the EMS. But then we also have the supporting species. And supporting species are species that are actually using that EMA for their ecology regularly. They're not vagrants. Vagrants are not used in the EMAs. And uh, they're not historical data. For example, there are many places that we have gone through where uh, you know sperm whales used to be very common and they are no longer because of the uh, whaling of the uh, 19th century. 
And uh, there are many caves in the Mediterranean that are not being used by monksios anymore because they have been extirpated from that. So they are potentially um, highly quali high quality habitat, but they have not been recognized yet. And those are not imas. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, I can see we've got a question. Um, it's great to see some names that I recognise here. So nice to see you all. Um, nice to see you, Heather. If you want to ask your question, you can unmute or turn your video on or keep it off, whatever works for you. Hi there. Um, my question is, the um, candidate Emma that you highlighted in the Pacific, um, I can't remember the specific areas off the top of my head, but it seems to be very, very close to areas that are being proposed um, as suitable for deep sea mining. What are your thoughts on this? And is this correct? That, that was all brilliant presentation. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you, Heather. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's um, it's uh, it's a big big thing coming up, unfortunately. And um, I think we have, uh, for example, in the uh, Clipton. Uh, zone uh, in the uh, Northeast Pacific, Eastern Tropical Pacific, actually, uh, there is going to be some uh, deep sea mining going in an area which is highly valuable in terms of its um, uh, biology. And uh, uh, this is particularly true for, um, for, for deep sea animals, of course, deep sea communities. But it's also true for any any anybody else in the water column, and uh, even at the surface, uh, for as far as marine mammals are concerned. So we are very concerned. But uh, this question of yours allows me to uh, come to a very important point of the uh, IMA tool: is that um, in in this phase in which we are being concentrating now and using all our energies. Uh, because you know the EMA secretariat is made of eight people, uh, we are concentrating on the identification of EMAs. Of course, the uh, there is no point in identifying EMAs if you don't do anything with them. But for now, we are relying very much on the scientific community and on public society to take the EMAs and do their their, their battles. Uh, with the uh, uh, with the decision makers, uh, because we we uh, we don't have the um, uh, the human the human power uh, to do that everywhere we have been identifying emas. Give you an example. Uh, we have been uh, making uh, four EMA in implementation demonstration trips. Uh, we went to Palau. We went to the Andaman Island. We went to Mozambique and uh, a month ago, we went to Pakistan, interacting with the local um, uh, stakeholders uh, and particularly with the local um, government stakeholders, you know, to bring up the point of the EMAs and uh, making recommendations, et cetera. When we were in uh, Mozambique, uh, that was before uh, COVID, um, there was a big problem with the uh, Ima, uh, the Bazaruto Island and um, in Hambane uh, Bay Ima, which um, hosts the last viable uh, dugong population of East Africa, of Africa actually, uh, because there is probably something around 350 dugongs still, you know, doing their things in a semi, semi undisturbed way. Uh, compared to all the small scattered uh, uh, places along the coast of Africa where you have five or 10 dugongs maximum and uh, with their, their numbers, uh, their day their days counted. Uh, so th there was a big, uh, um, uh, a big problem there. Uh, there was a coalition of NGOs very uh, upset because the government had uh, released uh, um, uh, exploration permits uh, to uh, South African oil and gas company. And uh, uh, so the government was involved, the, uh, the civil society was involved. And uh, we think that with the identification of an IMA there, we actually um, uh, placed the straw that uh, broke the camel back. Uh, 
because in the end the company withdrew its um, its um, uh, willingness to explore the area and uh, which would have been uh, very very concerning for the dugong population but uh, the the fact that we could do that was uh, was casual because we had selected Mozambique without knowing that that was going to be uh, one of the problems. Uh, but we cannot really uh, go everywhere. We don't have just don't have that human capital there. I'm just going to ask a question as well, if I may. Um, it's just uh, with that in mind, then. Is there uh, any uh, understanding or agreement with agencies like the World Bank that uh, you would um, that, that financing for projects like oil and gas or mining or wind farms or whatever people may choose to develop offshore? Is there any uh, requirement or another level of, of uh, assessment that, you know, perhaps the World Bank already considers for IMAs or have you come across anything like this? Yeah, uh, this is something that uh, we are just beginning to uh, follow with the um, uh, International Finance Corporation, uh, which is a World Bank um, initiative. And um, uh, so we, we are trying to, uh, you know, we're at the beginning of really of uh, conversations with the this type of um, uh, organizations, uh, because uh, the World Bank is actually interested in knowing, uh, you know, what the, the background uh, of where they, um, they actually uh, fund projects. Uh, it's, it's part of their job, actually, to gather this information and in and, and if there are other organizations like our task force that can provide that information which is of high quality because we use the best experts that we can find in each region uh you know we are making them a uh, service and uh so we are not quite uh far enough into the process uh, for me to be able to tell you, yes, we are doing this, but we are entertaining that kind of conversations. Also with the Protus, and the Protus organization, which is, you know, with the uh, with the main uh, uh, the main uh, oil and gas companies in the world through the um, uh, World Conservation Environment uh, Organization. I don't remember WCMC. Um, uh, but from UNEP in uh, Cambridge, UK. So yeah, we are we are starting to move in that direction, but um, uh, we still need to make progress in that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, in some assessments where IMAs have been, have come into consideration uh, for seismic surveys, for for instance, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so at least uh, there's an awareness of IMAs in at least the Mediterranean, but. Uh, I'm not so sure how, how it works in the rest of the world, to be honest. And it would be really great if it was you know, taken on by the World Bank as something as, to be considered yeah. at least. Even in Greece, you know, we uh, we know that the Greek government has released permits to uh, do uh, research into, you know, the Hellenic Trench, for example. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, those are... Uh, those are, you know, big, big things moving uh, outside of our sphere of influence, and uh, we will see, we will see what happens, particularly in countries that need money. Yes, unfortunately, money is always a requirement, but yeah, at least there seems to be a. a it does raise the bar for um, assessment and for mitigation and for. Maybe, yeah, it, 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 I, even with, um, even though the surveys uh, in the Hellenic Trench went ahead, I, I think there's, hopefully there's been a bit more consideration to sort of temporal mitigation mm. and spatial mitigation, as well as, you know, MMOs and PAM operators and stuff like that as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, Heather's got another question, I think. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I um, suddenly realised um, a penny dropped in my head. Um, the new um, 
high seas treaty should obviously help um, with raising the awareness of the IMAs even further, as, uh, along with all the fantastic work you, you've been doing. But surely that will benefit you more and give more of a highlight into the importance of IMAs um, and to have more connectivity for um, wildlife corridors for the oceans. Yeah, I know that's true. That's true. And of course, we were all extremely happy and happy when we learned that finally there made some concrete progress and maybe this year is going to be celebrated 2023 of the year in which the uh, the high seas treaty is going to uh, unfortunately not come into force but at least be signed um and in fact uh, we are hoping that uh, with the emas we will be able to offer uh, some ideas of where the area based uh, management can be um, can be uh, considered in the high seas. Um, unfortunately, uh, we uh, were hoping to have many more EMAs in the high seas than we do, uh, than we actually do. And this is because the data in the high seas are much scarcer than, uh, than, uh, than the, in the EZ. Um, possibly, uh, some of these data can come from your group, from the uh, Marine Mammal Observers, although I guess most of your work is in the EZ, just like uh, like um, in other type of science. Um, but yes, the uh, the the answer, the short answer is yes. We are we're hoping that uh, uh, we we will be able to provide a good contribution to that process yeah unfortunately um uh, the type of work we're involved with always requires a license so or nearly always requires a license um so therefore it has to be within an eez to be licensed so we wouldn't have very much data if any outside of eez um and uh yeah i suppose that, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's always difficult to get it um information on the high seas uh, and it and the other thing i suppose with the high seas is that uh, there are marine protected areas are proposed you're going to have to have a management strategy um and some sort of regulatory body if it's going to be meaningful whereas yeah. imas are just really just to say these animals are here and and you should take notice and that's my simplify i suppose i mean correct me and by all means please but it's no, more... no, you're right. You're, you're right. You're right. It's a it's a challenge. Of course, technology is going to help in in uh, in the high seas management uh, eventually. Mm. Um, but we need to do a lot of work before that happens. Yeah, it's a much more expensive environment to work in because it's further offshore as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any more? Questions from anybody? Anybody like to raise a hand to ask a question? Got about nine minutes left. Um, if not, I was just wondering. Um, you know, we're, we're all sort of MMOs pan. That's what the MMOA is for. Um, or you know, that's sort of the area that we work in. How would you say the, the marine mammal habitat.org website where all the IMAs are available would be helpful to MMO, MMOs and PAMOs? Um, I think I know the answer, um, but just just to get some information from you, Giuseppe, do you think it would be information and um, it would be key for MMOs, PAMOs, maybe going to new areas? They could go onto the website and download the packs. Um, yeah, just a little insight for, for people on the call or people that may watch it back, um, how the IMAs can help them working offshore. Well, you know, exchanging information between different groups is always a good thing to do. Uh, having said that, however, I think that you people, uh, you know, when you start uh, working in a particular area, you already know uh most of the things that we uh are gathering uh because uh but i don't know exactly how your work happens so 
I must admit that I have some ignorance about you know the the uh, the, the mechanics of uh, of your of your uh, enterprises. But I, I would imagine that when you are hired to be marine mammal observers in a particular uh, location, uh, then you before you go aboard, you know already everything that needs to be that is available on that particular uh, area. If you don't, and if that is an IMA, then of course uh, uh, our work will be useful to you. But um, I don't know if that has happened. Uh, I, I think you you are older than the IMA, not personally. I mean, but the as an organization, and uh, not even as as an organization as a category, you are older than the IMAs, and uh, so you have had more time to collect information. And in, in some cases, we have been using uh, information that has been uh, reported by uh, your, your, your groups uh, in order to uh, strengthen our EMA identifications. Yeah, I, I just to add on that, I mean, I think the EMA Atlas is very useful to uh, MMOs, really, to, to be honest, because we don't always get told exactly where we're working until uh, until we're on, on the vessel and we're actually steaming towards uh, the location or whatever. Sometimes we don't get very much information. Mm -hmm. um, and it and the EMA Atlas is great because it, it, it gives, you know, some information on what species the, the, the EMA is designed for and and you know other uh, supporting species as well. So you know having an idea of what you're what you can expect to see is tremendously useful. And if it's an area that's important for a particular species, then you know it, it's if there is an argument for any extra protection. Um, but usually that's all dictated by the license. What mm -hmm. mitigation we 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 apply. But it's still really, really useful. That I find the M Atlas quite useful um, if you're working in a location that has been covered by the IMA process. Um, as for the the, the data that, that comes back from seismic surveys, getting that from regulators can be problematic. But um, you know, it is you know really, really important data, and and uh, getting the species as correct as possible is is important as well. Um, if it's going to be fed into um any kind of research information so mm -hmm. yeah all of that but yeah no i i think the uh, email work is fantastic i th think what you're doing is great um uh, and you know I, I don't know if anybody else has got any questions but i think uh, unless uh, anybody else has then i think we can sort of um oh there's a, yeah um you know we can wrap this up i think what what the you know the the work is really really good really 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 worthwhile um and because it's not um a marine protected area um that you're trying to propose then it, it it's very difficult to oppose uh for anybody to oppose it then and you can highlight areas of importance without getting into uh management issues and and uh, you know what do, what does it mean it just means that this area is important for marine mammals and you know then it's up to the regulator to take notice of that and and to you know, to respond appropriately. Uh, but it's not a marine protected area, so they don't actually have, in theory, any work to do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's no, it's fantastic. And thank you for, uh, you know, taking the, the time, uh, you know, especially as you're not feeling very well to do this. Um, and, and uh, you know, hopefully it hasn't been too difficult. Um, and, and, uh, I'm, I'm comfortably lying in my bed. <laughs> uh, well, uh, as long as you're comfortable, that's fine. Yes. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for involving me. Yeah, it's always good, as I said, to uh, you know to have two different uh, groups of people talking to each other when they are they have very similar uh, objective or goal, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, it's, it, um, that's fantastic. And and uh, will you be at the ECS this year or? No, I cannot make it, unfortunately. Mm. Oh, that's a, be a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I miss it. Cannot do everything. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you know, one thing I haven't said is that the EMA program has uh, actually helped a new program, the ISRA, Important Shark and Ray Areas, coming up. 
and uh, so I'll be soon going to Tunis for the Mediterranean region of the important shark and ray areas meeting. So that's okay. adding to my plate, and uh, I cannot be traveling too much. Is that in in May or is it? Yeah, it's going to be at seven to twelve May, I think. Okay. So okay. Oh, okay. Oh, but that'll be uh, yeah, that'll be worthwhile as well, I would imagine. Is that yeah. going to be another ten-year process going around the globe, um, identifying important areas for sharks and rays? They are much faster than us because they have a lot of money, much more oh. than we do. <laughs> Okay. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, well. Yeah, everybody's funding shark research and conservation nowadays. Oh, uh, okay. That's good. Well, yes. that's, that's been great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the questions as well. We're just having some great feedback come through. So a lot of people saying thanks for the presentation. Uh, very informative. So thank you very much for that. Um, this is recorded, so we will put this session on our YouTube um, and we'll let our members know when it's up and send the link out as well. Um, but no, we really hope you feel better. Thank you so much for taking the effort. Really, really great session. Um, definitely lots for me to take away um, and I'm sure for others as well. So Wonderful. thank you very much. And, I'm very happy. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. Thank All you. right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.